So hello and welcome to my lecture series on microeconomics. So in this series of slides, I talk about public goods. So we classify goods according to whether or not they have the property of rivalry. So a good that doesn't have the property of rivalry will have the property of non-rivalry. And we can classify goods according to if they have the property of excludability or non-excludability. So, so what do these things mean? Well, we'd say a good is rival if one person's consumption of that good will, di will diminish how much exists for other people. So a good is excludable when consumption can be restricted, for instance, to, pay to paying customers. Okay, so to this point in the class and in lecture slides, all the goods and services that we've considered have been private goods. So private goods are going to be those that have the characteristic of rivalry and excludability. So an example, suppose there's a double-double from my favorite fast food restaurant, In-N-Out Burger, and it's sitting here on the table. If I eat that double-double burger, there is one less in the universe for other people to consume, right? So it definitely has the property of rivalry. My consumption of the good diminishes how much remains for others. That's rivalry. It's also, it's also excludable. So the double-double is also excludable in that it's not possible to consume one without first acquiring it typically through purchase, right? So it, excludability means consumption is limited essentially to paying customers. So here's the table of the further classifications we can make. So if a good is rival and excludable, that's a private good. That's like the double-double burger I was just talking about. If a good is rival but non-excludable, we call that a common resource. So a common resource would be something like a private beach. So the idea is that anybody can go there. You don't have to pay. Uh, and, you know, it's not limited to paying customers if it's a, if it's a public beach. Uh, however, the more people that are there, the less beach there is for other people, right? So consumption of the beach is rival, meaning, like, people take up space. Space is scarce. So, it's, uh, so we classify that as a common resource, good that's non-excludable, but that's rival in consumption. So... If a good is non-rival but excludable, that's what we call a club good. So a club good would be something like a concert or a sports contest, um, football game, basketball game, something like that, something that you, gotta, you pay a ticket for, right? You pay your ticket, pay for your ticket, you get it, admission into the venue, and so they're, the good's clearly excludable. It's limited to paying customers or those that have a ticket. But it's non it's it's non rival because your presence there isn't diminishing how much of the performance remains for other people. So when you watch the football game or you watch a concert or something, uh, there's still plenty of concert and football game for other people, right? That's what we mean by non rival. Your consumption does not diminish how much remains for others. And a good that's non rival and not excludable is what we call public good. So public good is non rival and non excludable. So this would be a situation where um, you, you consume the good and it has no effect on how much remains for other people. Uh, and you can't, you, and we're not limiting consumption to paying customers. So my example would be something like national defense, right? So, uh, so national defense, the benefits you get from national defense are not restricted to those who have paid taxes, for instance. Uh, it's everybody within the borders is protected, and uh, it's non it's non rival. So when somebody who hasn't paid for the when, when somebody, well, I'll remove it from payment. So when somebody consumes the benefit of national defense, that doesn't affect how much remains for other people. So the fact that I'm protected by our military, um, in no way diminishes how much other people are protected, right? So that's what we mean by a public good, non rival and non excludable. There's a problem, right, with public goods because they're non-rival and because they're not excludable. And one of the problems is the free riding problem. So free riding is where somebody who hasn't paid is able to consume the good. So free riding is possible in the case of public goods because the pub, because the good is non-excludable. It's not limited to paying customers. So those who do not contribute to the provision of the good are still able to enjoy it. And if that's the case, then why would you contribute? If I can, if I can benefit from the good without making any, making any uh, contribution to its funding, why would I ever fund the public good? And if you don't, well, then that then you're a free rider. And so, the free riding problem is this incentive problem between individuals and 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 the group essentially. 
So for example, anyone who listens to NPR or watches PBS but never makes a donation is a free rider. Uh, and the free rider problem is really prevalent here because whether or not you donate, the level of programming is the same. So you you can increase your donation level or decide to donate. That's not going to have any effect on the quality of programming if we're looking just at the individual level. Now, if we're looking in the aggregate, if everybody makes a decision to donate, that might have an effect, right? But if, if we're just looking at the individual's choice, that's not going to have very much influence over the, uh, the funding structure for NPR or PBS. And people know this, and so a lot of people don't donate, right? Um, so every individual has an incentive to free ride. You could only worsen your situation in some sense by donating, right? Apart from any moral or ethical considerations, you have less money after making the donation. The problem, if everyone free rides, there's not enough funds to provide the public good, right? So there's not enough funds to produce the good. Uh, another example of free riding, so suppose we privatize national defense. Suppose rather than taxes, every household could voluntarily give money to fund the military. Well, this could never work for a variety of reasons, uh, but one problem is that presumably those with the most to lose would value defense the most and then would contribute most of the funding. And so there would be potentially a pretty obvious free rider problem here where people might rightfully conclude that billionaires like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are going to protect Seattle and protect Omaha. And so, you know, you might not make a donation uh, and you might just decide to live in those areas where you'd assume that their mercenary army is going to protect uh, th those regions, right? So it'd be an example of free riding, right? People would maybe rightfully assume that those with the most to lose, people who are wealthy, would end up would end up funding uh, military if we had a privatized uh, if we privatized national defense, right? There's a clear free riding problem there, right? We'd get under provision. We wouldn't get enough national defense, right? So the silly example illustrates the need for a third party or a government, right, to provide the public good, to pay for national defense, to make sure we have enough, right? And that's Im that's important in general with public goods. Same thing with NPR, um, a lighthouse, other examples of public goods. So there's a real, there's a related problem for tragedy of the commons, um, so or for common resources. This is called the tragedy of, of the commons. So with common resources, the good is not excludable, but it's rival in consumption. So every person's use diminishes how much remains for everybody else, but every individual has an incentive to raise their consumption, and this depletes the resource that remains for everybody else. It's a problem because we can't exclude people from consuming the good. So what's the problem? Well, individual incentives directly conflict with group incentives, and that's exactly that's exactly uh, sort of the heart of the problem. So here's an example. Suppose we have a village green. Everybody has one cow that can provide milk. Someone gets the idea of adding a second cow and selling the extra milk. Well, it's great for them, uh, but now there's less grass for everybody else. And so if enough people do this, the grass gets depleted, and now every every person's cow's productivity falls. And so eventually the village green is gone. Now this is a tragedy because nobody can have a cow. And it's completely unavoidable if we were to manage the resource better, right? What's the problem? Well, the individual incentives for adding another cow can uh, sort of don't take full account of the negative externality that you're exerting on everybody else by virtue of depleting the resource, right? The individual incentives conflict with social incentives. Presumably there's room for a third party or government intervention to help people manage the resource more effectively. So, okay, we'll go ahead and conclude here.